All right. Um, once again, this is the first webinar I've done this way. I'm used to teaching in person and classroom style. So be patient with me. Hopefully we get through this well and you learn something new and you're inspired to go uh, start your butterfly garden or add to it. Um, I will, after the presentation, I'm going to send out um, a survey monkey. If you don't mind uh, just doing an evaluation, just a few quick questions um, about the class and what we can improve on and uh, you know what you'd like to see next time. And then if you want, I can email you a PDF version of the presentation so you'll have everything on paper or on your computer screen to refer back to. Okay. So I am Sarah Weber, and I am the Florida-Friendly Landscaping Education and Training Specialist at, for the University of Florida Charlotte County office. Um, I'm at my home right now in Punta Gorda. Um, our office is in Port Charlotte. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Let's see, maybe. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, why butterfly gardening? There's actually a lot of benefits to butterfly gardening for both you and the critters. Um, it's going to attract wildlife to your garden for enjoyment, observation, study, photography. It's great for ecosystem and habitat conservation. Um, if you can use native plants, use native plants when possible. It uh, attracts pollinators of all sorts. Um, we like the bees, of course, unless you're allergic to them, but we like the bees and uh, birds, uh, moths, any other pollinators it's gonna attract as well. Brings color and life to your garden and it's really a great family-friendly hobby for all ages. Doesn't matter your age, it is, it's fun to do, it's relaxing and it's really enjoyable. Um, with any of our gardening classes, we're all going to try to, uh, Keep in line with the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping, right plant, right place, watering efficiently, fertilizing appropriately, uh, using mulch when you're able to, attracting wildlife is of course where butterfly gardening comes in, um, although we'll use a lot of these practices with butterfly gardening. Uh, managing yard pests responsibly, there's good bugs and bad bugs, um, recycling, number eight, reducing storm water runoff, and nine, protecting the waterfront. So with that being said, using native wildflowers and plants. Your garden doesn't necessarily have to be all native. Um, it's great to use natives. It doesn't necessarily have to, to be Florida friendly. Um, but when you use native wildflowers and plants, generally speaking, they are going to require less irrigation once they're established. They're already adapted to our region, soil type, and climate, so it makes them easier keepers than many. Re they require limited maintenance and pest control. And they're also going to provide food and shelter for not only butterflies, but for other pollinators, birds, and wildlife. So if you learn nothing else from today, this is kind of the bottom line of butterfly gardening. You're going to need both nectar plants and larval or host plants, commonly called host plants. So your nectar plants are gonna be those that are going to attract and feed the adult butterflies. They are going, your nectar plants are going to um, invite those butterflies into your yard. They're going to be attracted to your yard to come to feed off of the nectar plants. So there you see a, if that's a polydomus swallowtail butterfly and it's feeding on a penta. Um, the larval, larval or host plants are those plants that the female butterflies are gonna come uh, lay their eggs on, which is a for, uh, food source for their caterpillars. So most butterflies only have specific plants that they're going to lay eggs on. So like right here, this is a clump of eggs and that is on um, pipe vine. And that is the host plant for this butterfly here, the polydomus swallowtail. So they only lay their eggs on pipe vine. Um, these guys over here are Eastern black swallowtail caterpillars. They have several host plants, but they're all generally in the same family, um, dill, fennel, uh, parsley, they'll eat those, they'll eat your herb garden. 
Um, so the nectar plants are going to invite the butterflies, butterflies in, the host plants give them a reason to stay. So I, in a perfect world, in your butterfly garden, you'll be able to see the entire life cycle or host the entire life cycle of a butterfly. So I'm gonna give you a few suggestions for native um, and Florida friendly nectar plants. This is um, by far not in a, a complete list. These are plants that the University of Florida suggests. These are plants that I personally use in my own yard and have had success with. Um, and they're just known butterfly attractors. So, and most of them I tried to, um, keep ones that are easier to find too, because sometimes when you're looking for butterfly plants, you can't find them, um, you know, at a nursery or a big box store. Um, so try to keep, keep them so they're easier to find for you. So the first uh, one is gonna be tick seed or Coreopsis. This is actually our state wildflower. You'll see this a lot um, in big pasture lands, along roadsides. Um, good news is it is becoming a popular landscape plant and it's becoming more popular at uh, nurseries and even the big box stores. It does, um, it does come in different shades, uh, varying, I mean they're mostly yellow but they have dark brown, uh, some orange and that sort of thing. Um, they are, they're great, they're easy keepers, they're drought tolerant, they're, for the most part, they're drought tolerant. Uh, they do well in full sun. They are um, an easy one to start with. Wild coffee. Um, you'll see this a lot out in, you know, woods, wild parts of uh, Florida, but uh, you can actually find this too now um, easier, especially at your native nurseries. It's a native shrub. It has small white flowers uh, in the spring and that is what's going to attract the butterflies. What's great about this too is the small red fruits in the summertime attract uh, the wildlife as well, the birds like them. You do need a fairly big space for them, however, because they can get up to 10 feet tall and they can spread out to eight feet wide. Um, but of course they can be pruned back, but goes back to that right plant, right place. Make sure you do have the room for it. This is my favorite uh, Maypop passion flower. Not only is it a great nectar plant, um, it's also a host plant for three different types of butterflies in our area uh, that lay eggs on this. This is one of our native passion flowers or passion vines. It's absolutely stunning. The large flowers, uh, you know, obviously the big purple flowers, you can see a bee on my photos, the bee, other pollinators love it too. Um, it, it is a pretty aggressive grower though, um, but it is, it, it's just gorgeous. It's a conversation piece. The butterflies love it. Um, it is one of our natives, like I said, there are a lot of different varieties uh, in cultivars of passion vine and passion flower. Uh, a lot of them are not native, but this is kind of the go-to native passion vine um, for our area, along with corky stem passion vine, which we're going to, um, we're going to talk about that as well. Okay. Trumpet creeper or trumpet vine. Not only do butterflies love this, but the hummingbirds love this. It's very pretty. Um, it does grow kind of sporadically. If you look at the photo to the right, oops, sorry, photo to the right. Uh, it can take over an area and it can appear a little bit messy, but it uh, has absolutely gorgeous flowers and uh, of course the butterflies love it. Climbing aster. This one's also good for more naturalized landscapes as it can appear messy as well. Uh, it's very fragrant. It works well on a trellis or a fence. You may not want to put this in a neat place in your landscape that you're trying to make look neat and organized because it will, it does, like I said, appear uh, fairly messy. Coral honeysuckle, a local favorite. 
also known as trumpet honeysuckle. It has these tubular shaped flowers. Ooh, sorry. Okay, tubular shaped flowers <coughs> in the spring and summer. It does great in full sun. It will do okay, do well in partial shade as well. Extremely drought tolerant and very low maintenance once established. Excuse me. Powder puff or sunshine mimosa. This guy is really low growing to the ground. Some people actually use it as uh, ground cover now. It does well with wear. It can actually be mowed. And um, some people call it sensitive plant. When you touch the leaves, they'll close up. And then it's got these adorable little powder puff flowers on it. Uh, this is from my own yard. I really, this is one of my favorite plants. Um, it does spread quickly, uh, but it stays very low to the ground. So it's great. Um, it, you can, people even use it in their lawns. You are seeing, maybe seeing it in medians more along roadsides. It's, uh, it's also a very easy keeper. Blanket flower or gelardia. Um, it's a mounding, it can be a mounding ground cover. Um, once again, look to the right, the bees love it, butterflies love it. It comes in uh, some different shades of oranges, reds, br uh, browns, and uh, it is one of our native wildflowers, and it's uh, it's just a, it's a superstar. It's a drought tolerant superstar. Purple cone flower, <clears throat> also known as echinacea. You may have heard of echinacea. Purple cone flower uh, flowers in the spring and the summer. It's a clumping perennial. It does well in uh, part sun, part shade, can even do well in full sun. It's really a showy flower. They're large flowers and they just look beautiful in big, uh, big groups of them. <coughs> Excuse me. How many of you out there ignore your plants and forget to water sometimes? This Dune sunflower is easy, easy, easy. It loves salt, it loves drought, it is extremely drought tolerant. Um, sandy soils, salty soils, it just, it really thrives. You can ignore it and it will continue to grow. Um, I don't know if you've all, most of you were local, I think on here, I've got some out of towners, but um, peach, uh, the Fort Charlotte Beach Complex, if you've been there recently, they have installed a lot of dune sunflower and it just looks gorgeous. And uh, they, it, it's often seen at the beach um, as well. When you go to the beach, it's common at our local beaches as well. Rebecca. Black-eyed Susan, um, lots of different varieties of this also uh, come in different uh, shades, varieties of yellows and oranges, drought tolerant as well. Um, and they're just super beautiful flowers, especially when they're in a big group. And when you plant a butterfly attractor in large groups, it's easier for the butterflies to find them. So instead of having a sporadic plant here and there, Think about having larger groupings of those plants. Um, it will be easier for the butterflies to find and, uh, and nectar from. Scarlet salvia or scarlet sage. Um, there's all sorts of different varieties of salvia. This happens to be the one, this isn't mine, but um, this happens to be the one I have, the variety I have in my yard. Uh, <clears throat> it's definitely a uh, one of the, the flowers in my yard that gets the most attention from the butterflies. It can look stringy or messy at times. So once again, if you're looking for that neat look, it might not be the route to go. But if you don't mind the, the wild look, it's really, it spreads easy. 
Um, it grows fast. It almost always has flowers on it. And it's, it's a pretty flower that the butterflies love. Porter weed. Porter weed, uh, we do have a native porter weed here. It's smaller than some of the ones that <clears throat> most people have or most, uh, or most of the big box stores sell. Um, if you can get the native one, that is um, certainly the route to go. It's a little bit smaller, shorter. Um, it does spread easily, has these great blue, purple colored flowers on it. And um, the picture on my left there is a monarch on mine at home. And uh, it's a great, it's really a great standard butterfly attractor. Pentas, pentas, they're not native, <clears throat> but they are uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping approved. They come in a variety of colors, red, uh, lavender, pink, white, dark purple, you can get them in many different colors. They are super easy to find. Um, you can find these at your big box stores. They, uh, in many colors, I've had most success as far as butterflies go, personally with the red, with the red and uh, the purples. Um, the white, they tend to not uh, be drawn to as much, but these are easy growers, easy keepers. Uh, almost always have blooms on them. Okay, so let's go back to elementary school for just a moment. Just a little butterfly life cycle refresher about metamorphosis. Let's see, hold on. Okay, I need to see my screen here a little better. All right, so of course, when you have a butterfly garden, you want the adult you want the adult to come into your yard female and she's going to lay eggs on your host plant so some eggs they some they lay some singly some do clumps of eggs there'll be eggs for a few days they will turn into the larva which is the caterpillar of course the caterpillar will eat neat 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 that um, that host plant until it decides it is ready to go off and become a chrysalis. Uh, depending on the species, the chrysalis uh, can take several days to several months and the chrysalis to emerge back into the adult butterfly. There are approximately 765 species of butterflies in North America. And here in Florida, we have about 180 verified butterfly species. And the saying goes, if you plant it, they will come, which is so true. Um, we're going to go through some of the butterflies common here in Charlotte County in Southwest Florida and their host plants. So those plants that you'll wanna to plant to get them to come in and lay their eggs on them so you can have that complete life cycle of butterflies. Our state butterfly we're gonna start off with, <clears throat> this is a zebra long wing. And uh, this zebra long wing here, it looks like it's feeding on Spanish needle right now, not its host plant. This plant is um, the maypot passion flower, corky stem passion flower, um, that big purple flower we were talking about earlier. And this is what their caterpillar or larva looks, looks like. Um, many of them, many of these butterfly caterpillars have these spikes here. Um, they are, these caterpillars are harmless to humans as far as if you can pick them up, you can touch them. When you touch the spikes, they're not, um, they're not toxic or anything like that. Keep in mind, however, that that's not true with all caterpillars in Florida. We do have some venomous butterfly caterpillars, or not butterfly, but they're usually moths, um, caterpillars in Florida that are, that you do not want to touch. So be sure you know what you're looking at and touching before you touch it, um, because there are a couple of from moths that could send you to the ER. 
but the guys we're talking about today, these guys, you can handle them, you can touch them, and they are, for the most part, they are fine. So here's those two native um, passion vines or passion flowers we were talking about. Uh, one on the left, once again, purple may pop passion flower, Passiflora incarnata. And the one on the right is quirky stem. This one's not near as pretty or showy. It has got a very tiny flower um, and it's got smaller leaves. It does get little blueberries on it, um, but this also is a host plant to not only the zebra long wings, but to golf fritillary butterflies and uh, Julia butterflies. So monarchs, this tends to be the favorite <clears throat> among a lot of people. I do have a lot of monarchs in my yard. We have a lot of monarchs in our area. Um, this happens to be a male monarch. You can tell by the little scent glands right there, those two dots. Uh, this is what their caterpillars look like. And their caterpillars go through five instars. Um, five instars meaning that they're going to shed their skin or molt um, five times. So when they come out of the egg, so see these little tiny dots here? Those are monarch eggs on the underside. They generally, for the most part, will lay most of their uh, eggs on the underside of milkweed. Um, hang on a second. I'm going to make sure everybody's muted because I'm hearing some background noise. Give me one second here. Okay. All right. So um, monarch caterpillars tend to look the same throughout their five instars for the most part, except they just get bigger and bigger. This one here looks like he's probably in his fifth instar, which means he's getting ready to uh, <clears throat> to make his chrysalis. So monarchs only lay their eggs on milk. We have several types of native milkweed here in Florida. Um, we're going to talk about those a little bit. This is butterfly weed. <clears throat> it has orange yellow flowers. It blooms late summer and early fall. And it ho hosts both monarch and queen <clears throat> caterpillars or butterflies. Um, this one is out of all of our native ones. In my experience, has been the easiest to find. Um, I just found uh, seeds at um, Home Depot the other day, not to pick one store over the other by any means. Um, I found these seeds also at um, Echo down in Fort Myers. A lot of the native nurseries sell both the plant and, uh, and the seeds. This is aquatic milkweed, another one of our native milkweeds. Um, I had this on a shelf that I was watering daily because hence the name aquatic needs a lot of water and it tends to grow in the swampier wet areas. And even though I was watering it every day, it just wasn't thriving. So I ended up sticking it down into my garden pond and felt like within days it just really thrived and started blooming. If you notice, all these little yellow things right here on there, those are not monarch eggs. Those are actually aphids, which are a common pest of um, milkweeds. Almost all my milkweeds at some point or another will get aphids. Thing is, you don't want to use pesticides on your milkweeds, obviously, because if you're killing the bad bugs, you're going to be killing the good bugs, which includes your caterpillars, which you don't want to do. Aphids, they tend to be fairly easy to get rid of. Um, I hose them off, I've smushed them. Um, <clears throat> last night I actually had a pot that I just tilted over on its side and just hosed them all off and that took care of the problem. Um, obviously with butterfly gardening, you really cannot use pesticides and you have to really be selective on how you're gonna do pest control. With aphids too, um, 
the good news is, is that they do have predators. Ladybugs eat them. Um, there's several species of other species of insects that will eat them, that will, wasps will eat them, um, that can help take care of the problem for you. Unless you have, if you have only a small infestation, it really doesn't do too much damage to your plant. However, they can multiply quickly. But if you have a small infestation, I generally just, I don't do a whole lot and kind of let nature take its course as long as it's not sucking the life out of my plant. Usually the predators will come along and eat them. Swamp milkweed, this is another one of our native milkweeds. Um, it's actually such a beautiful flower. Um, and uh, this one, I have a harder time finding. I do have one of these that I got at a local native nursery. Um, that's your really your best bet is your local native nurseries. And right now with a lot of us not going out and a lot of places being closed, um, there are a lot of these nurseries that are doing delivery orders as well. And keep in mind, you can get plants online. I've had success with um, eBay and, and Etsy and some of those other um, online places. I've ordered native plants through native nurseries online and had really good success with them. So don't be afraid to shop online. I know it's always more fun to go to the nursery and really get your hands on things and shop around. But right now, since we're, most of us are sticking at home, there are options for you to acquire some of these plants. So when a monarch and most other, or, uh, most other butterflies as well, when this monarch is getting ready to make its chrysalis, what they do is they hang in this J shape um, and they're gonna hang like that usually for quite a few hours, maybe 24 hours. And then they, they will make this bright green chrysalis, which this picture doesn't really give it justice. It's, they have a gold, nice gold rim up here and gold dots on it. They're really quite beautiful. And then a day or two before, it's going to emerge or a close. Um, you, you're, you're able to see the wings right through it. <clears throat> and then the day of, it will turn black or clear. And so you can see right through, and this is uh, a monarch just starting to emerge. Um, when it comes out, their wings will be all crinkled and they will look deformed. But in most cases, not all, but most cases, they will hang um, upside down, kind of like this guy's doing, and they'll hang to stretch out their wings and pump their wings um, until they are dry and ready to fly. It usually takes a couple hours for them. So they're eggs for a few days, they're caterpillars for about 10 days, they're in their chrysalis for about 10 days, and until they emerge or close. So to tell the difference between a male and a female, males have the, these visible, which we already talked about a little bit, the scent glands on their hind wings, and they're usually a tad bit smaller than the females. Uh, the females have, have thicker veins on their wings and they're usually bigger. They're not too hard to tell apart um, when you're able to get a close look at them. As they're flying, not the easiest to tell apart. But most butterflies, they have some sort of color variation for the most part that you can tell them apart if you want to. So this is a monarch caterpillar eating giant milkweed, which we didn't talk about giant milkweed. It's not one of the native species, but if you have a lot of monarchs, um, they, I tell you, they go through milkweed so fast. They, they just, they can strip a plant. And, Speaking of that as well, when the plant's stripped, it's not gonna kill the plant. Milkweed grows back fast, and the same goes for most other host plants. They really, they don't kill the plant. They grow, it will grow back, even if all the leaves are gone because they've been eaten. Um, but the giant milkweed's kind of nice if, you're, if you've got a lot of monarchs in your yard. It's bigger leaves, uh, they're thick, and it goes a longer way than some of the other milkweeds would as far as feeding them. And 
Down here, this, in case you didn't know, is caterpillar waste. It's called frass. Um, that's pretty much what caterpillars do. They eat and eat and eat and create frass. Gulf fritillary. This butterfly is probably, I'm in Punta Gorda, and it is probably the most seen butterfly in my yard in particular. Um, might not be the most in yours, but it is extremely common down here. It is uh, also another, the second butterfly that uses the passion flat flower vines, the purple maypop, um, corky stem passion flower. Here it's feeding on a pink penta. And this is what they look like when they first come out of their chrysalis. And sometimes people get confused on butterflies because their top wings look a lot different than their bottom. So you can tell this guy doesn't even look like the same butterfly. At, when you see uh, the top view, you'll see what I'm talking about a little better. This is what their caterpillars uh, look like. Um, <clears throat> once again, they are spiky, but they do not, they don't sting. Um, it's a way to scare off predators. If you touch them, that they're really not that pokey to a human. You can pick them up, no problem. This is one my kids have handled a lot. Um, and they do look a lot like oleander caterpillars, by the way. If you're familiar with oleander and the oleander wasp moths, um, they look very similar, except the oleander caterpillar has much longer uh, spikes or on, on them. This is what their eggs look like. They tend to lay their eggs on the tendrils of the, the vines in a single form. I keep losing my arrow here, okay. And here's a chrysalis. The kind of cool thing about their chrysalis, obviously one, they blend in well. If they're on a plant, they look like a dead leaf. Um, and if you touch them, they wiggle. The monarchs, they don't. If you touch their chrysalis, they they don't move, but with these guys, they will wiggle if you touch them. And as far as ID of <clears throat> male and females, uh, the females are a lot browner than the male. Um, they have more markings. Um, they're a little bit duller. The males are a little bit brighter with less uh, brown and black on them. Polydomus swallowtail. This guy um, is another one that I have quite a few in my yard, but I also have a huge pipe vine. Um, I have a Dutchman's pipe vine in my yard that um, has really taken over. <laughs> and so we have tons of these caterpillars and uh, butterflies in our yard right now. Um, here's a photo of one. Uh, depositing her eggs. These guys do lay their eggs in clumps uh, and they'll lay them either on the leaf or most often lay on the vine, the vine part itself on a pipe vine. And their caterpillars are really cool because most of the time they stay in groups. A lot of ca caterpillars tend to be solitary and kind of go do their own thing. These, this is uh, when they're tiny, they're all huddled together. They, this is probably second or third in star. Um, they still stay together. And even as the larger ones, until they go off to make their chrysalis, they, they can often be found together. And their chrysalis look like aliens, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, they are very strange looking uh, chrysalis, um, but that's a nice close up of one very uh, different looking. So all of these butterfly chrysalises look just a little bit different, but it's nice to know what you're looking for because obviously um, something like that looks kind of like just a dead leaf, which is obviously their uh, way of camouflaging themselves. So black swallowtail, um, their host plants are your herb garden. Uh, their host plants, parsley, dill, fennel, uh, 
they have a few others. I got to the point where um, I just, my herb garden, I just put a lot of the plants over to the butterfly garden and let them do their thing. Um, if you do share your herb garden with your uh, butterflies, you do obviously want to make sure if you're going to eat any of your herb garden that you're, you want to take the eggs off, um, you know, when you wash your herbs and move them to another plant. They have actually very beautiful uh, caterpillars. That's what their caterpillars look like. When they're small though, they look quite different. We're gonna show you some of those pictures next. And this is what their chrysalis looks like. So as you can see, some caterpillars, they look almost similar from first instar you know, throughout their, the caterpillar stage of their life. Um, some look exactly the same. This guy looks totally different from the first instar, uh, you know, to when it's ready to pupate. And the male black swallowtail and female, the male has more yellow, the female has more blue. Once again, there's male and female. Giant swallowtails, these guys are just gorgeous. They are Florida's largest butterfly. They can have a wingspan up to seven inches. Uh, once again, they look quite different, different views. A um, lot more yellow on the underside. And you can see they have a yellow uh, abdomen as well. They have a lot of host plants. Um, <clears throat> the host plant I personally have for them in my uh, yard is wild lime. Um, I was able to find this one actually at Butterfly Estates down in, um, down in Fort Myers. Um, it's a quick growing small tree, so you gotta kind of Keep in mind where you're going to put it if that's something you're going to get. Um, it does have thorns on it, um, so it can be prickly at times. So put it out of the way where you're not going to be walking into it. Um, there's this whole list, a lot of trees too, um, that their, their host plants are. Um, and keep in mind too to purchase host plants by their botanical names because a lot of times same common names can be used for several plants, and sometimes those aren't even related at all. <clears throat> Eastern tiger swallowtail, they also utilize a large variety of host plants, um, mostly trees, cottonwood, ash, birch, wild black cherry, tulip tree, uh, sweet bay, magnolia, willow. Uh, they have, in my opinion, one of the coolest caterpillars. They look like, these are not their eyes, but they look like eyes to help keep predators away. I have not been lucky enough to have a whole lot of these in my yard. I've had some uh, pass through, but not a, uh, not a regular population. White peacock. I have a ton of these in my yard because I happen to have a lot of fog fruit or frog fruit, also known as turkey tangle, that's in my lawn. Um, I do not have the best, prettiest lawn by any means. I have quite a bit of weeds in my lawn, this being one of them that many consider weeds, um, but it is, the, uh, it is the host plant for uh, the white peacock. These are two just resting um, or roosting underneath the plant. Once again, there's that frog fruit, fog fruit, turkey tangle, has a lot of different names, tiny little flowers. Queen butterflies, their host plant also milkweed like the monarchs. Um, they look a little similar to monarchs as well and so do their caterpillars. Uh, since they both use milkweed for their host plant, 
Um, here we have a little bit of a comparison here so you can tell them apart. The monarch only has two pair of antenna and the mon monarch has yellow bands. The queen is gonna have three pair of antenna and it has more yellow circles than it does bands or yellow dots along its side as well. And as far as telling the butterflies apart, when they're up close like this, it's not too hard to tell, but when they are um, flying, it's a little bit more difficult. Monarchs have uh, the black veins when the wings are open and queen veins are not black and they're much less noticeable. Julia's, Julia long wings. Uh, their host plants are passion flower vines. This is the third butterfly that uses that passion flower vine and quirky stem passion flower. These guys are mostly in southern parts of Florida. You're not going to find these in the northern parts of Florida. I think Charlotte County is about the most northern part of Florida that um, you'll see them in. Um, they're also uh, prevalent down in southern Texas <coughs> and in Central America. When they roost or they rest with their wings closed, they really camouflage well as dead leaves. And their color variation, they have color variations with age and gender. Um, these are one of the longer lived butterflies. Um, they will fade with time. So when they're young and new and newly emerged, they tend to be a much brighter orange. And as they age, they get a little more tattered and faded. There's a male to the left and your female to the right. Um, males tend to be more of a solid orange. Females tend to have a lot more brown on them <clears throat> or black. And this is what the Julia's caterpillar or larva looks like on the left. It looks pretty scary, <laughs> scary to predators. Um, and their chrysalis looks like the one to the right. Long-tailed skippers. We have quite a few skippers in Florida. Um, we're not gonna go into a bunch of them, but they're often confused with moths because they're smaller, um, but they are, they are butterflies. This is a long-tailed skipper that is feeding on a zinnia, and their host plants are butterfly pea and different bean plants. Cloudless sulfur, these are the big yellow butterflies that you may often see flitting around. Um, they feed on cassias and senas. Um, they're younger caterpillars in the first and second instar there. They tend to be green and a lot of times they'll stay green, but a lot of times they will turn into um, a brighter yellow, like you see below there. Uh, they have quite a few native um, uh, host plants. Sensitive pea, wild sensitive plant, uh, partridge pea, lots of different senas. Oh, my cat, sorry. Um, after, uh, and then there's some introduced species that they also feed on. So we've gone through some of the butterflies and once again, not a complete list of all the butterflies we have in our area. I chose those because I, being the teaching from Punta Gorda and Charlotte County, um, these are ones that I have personally seen in my yard that I personally had success with. So I know they're here. I know they're fairly easy to attract and that's why I chose those. There are quite a few others that are in our area. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit where you can find those others um, and the plants that will attract them. So as far as garden design goes, <clears throat> A wide assortment of flowers is better than having just a few kinds. The butterflies, they're attracted to brightly colored, simple flowers with good places to perch. To make sure that nectar is always available, you want to choose your flowers so that something's always in bloom. Um, so it's always nice, obviously, some bloom in spring, fall, summer, winter down here. So if you have a good variety, um, it kind of helps to make sure something's always in bloom. Uh, once again, like we talked about earlier, provide a combination of those ad adult nectar sources 
and larval host plants. So your nectar plants and your host plants. Nectar ones, the ones the adults feed on. Host plants, the ones they lay their eggs on. This is gonna attract the maximum variety of butterfly species. It encourages butterflies to remain in your yard, reproduce and build populations instead of just passing through. And then it allows you to appreciate all the life stages. Incorporate native plants into the landscape whenever possible. Um, most of the butterflies in our area, most of their host plants are going to be natives. Um, the butterflies are native, they're going to host on the native plants. And they're, once again, they're adapted to the re region, which makes them easier to take care of, makes them easier keepers, less maintenance, less time consuming provide a number of different flower colors. Uh, different butterfly species are attracted to different flower colors. So include the yellows, oranges, whites, and blues, as well as the reds, pinks, and purples. And provide a mix of flower shapes. The feeding behavior and proboscis length um, of a butterfly will dictate which flowers will be visited. Most butterfly gardens people think of as in full sun, which a lot of butterflies do are attracted to those full sun plants. But if you plant some in shade as well, some of those forest species um, do prefer the shadier locations, uh, which is helpful in attracting a more diverse uh, group of butterflies or species of butterflies to your yard. Plant and groupings, it's aesthetically pleasing, um, providing masses of color, it's more apparent in the landscape and it allows larvae to locate additional food sources in uh, event of a shortage. And then to going back to right plant, right place, choose appropriate plants for each location. Um, make sure you know each plant, uh, plants, oops, typo there, sorry, basic water, light, and soil requirements so it will perform and grow to its maximum potential. Right plant, right place. So don't feel overwhelmed. I know I just gave you a lot of information and there's quite a bit of more information out there. It's kind of a never ending learning experience when you're talking about butterfly gardening, but I really don't want you to feel overwhelmed with anything, especially if you're just starting. First of all, you don't need to have a huge garden to be successful. Um, start with a small goal. You can start by just adding some nectar plants for the adult butterflies to feed on or just start by trying to attract a specific species by planting their host plant and um, a couple nectar plants. You don't need to have a big backyard to do this. You could live in a condo and have a patio and do container butterfly gardening. Um, this one is great. Uh, this one's nectar plants. It's got black eyed Susans in there, firecracker plant, that's the red plant in the back there, and salvia. You can even do a planter that ha for a spe uh, specific type of butterfly. So this one's a black swallowtail planter. So it's got the host plant that it's gonna lay eggs on at the bottom, which is parsley. It's got nectar plants, um, the pentas here, and then the salvias up here to the top. And keep in mind your um, USDA plant hardiness zone. Uh, when picking out flowers and uh, plants as well, what's going to do what best in your zone. Um, in Charlotte County, um, the coastal, most of the coastal areas are 10A and more inland is going to be 9B. So make sure you're picking out plants that are appropriate for your area. When you shop at your native nurseries, um, they generally will have plants. It's a little bit easier. Um, when you're going to a big box store, sometimes they do, unfortunately, they do sell plants that may not be best for our area. Uh, and I'm not knocking big box stores, so don't get me wrong. Um, but you just have to do a little more homework um, if you're not familiar with the plants and the zone um, and how well they'll do here. Uh, you just have to do a little more homework when you go and know what you're looking for uh, to make sure you don't bring something home and plant it just for it to die a couple months later because it wasn't in the right zone or not in the right place. So where to obtain these plants and seeds? <clears throat> Number one, 
and we've already said this, but be sure that the plants are pesticide free. Um, I can't tell you how many times someone's gone to a big box store and they have milkweed, they brought it home and all the caterpillars died um, because unfortunately it was treated for pesticides. Now, not all plants at big box stores are treated, um, but you need to find out from the grower before, uh, before purchasing those plants to make sure that they haven't been treated with pesticides because it's setting yourself up for failure. Um, most of the, not all, but most of the local nurseries and the native ones, um, for the most part, generally speaking, don't use near as many pesticides as some of the big box stores do. Um, one thing to look for too, we talked about those pesky aphids on milkweed, but if you're going to a big box store, um, I've had experience with this in the past, there'll be a bunch of milkweed out front that just looks beautiful and perfect and no bugs and no holes where it's been chewed on. But if I go clear to the back of the store, there'll be some milkweed just full of aphids and, full, and it'll have caterpillars on it. And you can probably bet those pretty plants up front um, were treated and the ones in the back probably were not. Um, so that's the big thing about buying plants for your butterfly gardens. Um, make sure they're not treated with pesticides. Um, always, I like to support your local places. So native nurseries, local nurseries, try that first. Um, in these times when you're not able to go out as much, once again, online, don't be afraid to buy online. Um, you can always swap seeds or cuttings with family, friends, and neighbors. You can propagate more from what you already have. Milkweed's actually fairly easy to propagate. Uh, you can cut a branch off and stick it in water um, and in no time at all it'll root itself and you have a whole new plant. Um, some people even have success just clipping a stem off and sticking it straight in soil and um, it, will, it will propagate itself into a new plant. All right, so we're almost done here. Let's see, what kind of time do we have? All right, I'm gonna do a short little story time. I want to tell you about Larry, Larry the larva. So most of the time, my favorite thing to do is butterfly garden. I love the pollinator plants. I love wildflowers, but I do do a little bit of vegetable gardening. And so a few years back, I was out trying to figure out what was eating my tomato plants. And um, I was looking through and Listen, bugs don't bother me very much. I do not, I can pick up about anything. I've picked up snakes, I pick up bugs. They don't bother me. For whatever reason, Larry the larva here, he, uh, he really caught me off guard and I screamed in my backyard, which made people come running to make sure I was okay over just this little, he's not very little, but this, uh, but this moth larva. He's a tomato hornworm. So you can see that's my child on the right, that's Mason. You can see how big this guy was. So what do we do? We bring, we raise butterflies, we do, you know, science experiments. So what do we do? We bring Larry, name him Larry, bring him inside, and we raise him because we want to see what he turns into. And it was kind of a fun little family experiment. So you can even see we sacrifice some tomatoes for him to eat. So unlike butterflies, this guy um, makes a cocoon. Sorry, my cat is chewing on my cord. Um, th these guys make cocoons underneath the soil. Um, so we put soil in an aquarium, and brought him in, and he turned into this beautiful five-spotted hawk moth, which I know most people don't want those on their tomatoes, and I understand that, but for us, it was a fun little experiment. And since we raised butterflies so much, we thought, let's try a moth. And so he was actually just a beautiful moth. So that's my little story. And in case you're wondering what the difference between moths and butterflies are anyway, um, moths, this is one of my favorite moths, by the way, that's a Luna moth. They're these giant bright green moths. They're just gorgeous. Anyway, um, moths, more, moths um, have a thicker, fuzzier body. They're active at night. They're nocturnal for the most part. They make a cocoon versus a chrysalis. 
and their wings are open when they rest. Where butterflies have clubbed antenna, uh, they have a thinner, smoother body. They are active during the day and they make a chrysalis, not a cocoon, and their wings are closed at rest. Uh, rest. Of course, there's a few uh, exceptions, but generally speaking, that's the difference. So some additional online resources. Um, this top one is uh, a fact sheet by University of Florida, Butterfly Gardening in Florida. And what's really cool um, when you go to that link there, that fact sheet will tell you all the butterflies that are in your zone, wherever you live in Florida, um, what their host plan is, uh, when you see them the most, what time of year, um, and what they feed on as far as nectar plants and host plants. And it's just a really great resource. And it's one of my favorite resources to refer back to. And then there's also um, a whole university webpage dedicated to butterfly gardening, which is really helpful as well. Okay, so I am going to figure out how to unmute everybody and see everybody. Hang on. Okay, and I'm going to figure out where the chat box is. Where's my chat box? So if there were questions. Chat, let's see. Okay. Let me start. Let me start here. Okay. Okay. One, what do you mean by aggressive grower? Uh, too big to keep potting. Um, aggressive just means it's a fast grower and it can it can really take over an area. It doesn't necessarily mean it's invasive or bad, especially if it's native here. But aggressive grower, they're just they they grow fast and it may be something you need to trim back or make sure you have a big area where it can expand on. Um, That's good because I don't. That's why I was like, oh, I don't think it'll go well in our space that I'm looking for. <laughs> okay, uh, Joyce, May Pop, don't the larva eat a lot of the plant? Does that interfere with reaching the flower stage? Um, yes, the larva do eat up a lot of the plant. I haven't had too much of a problem. Um, mine still flower. Um, I couldn't tell you 100% whether or not it's going to interfere with reaching the flower stage. I assume that, you know, of course, if the plant is completely eaten, it would certainly interfere. Um, but I haven't had one completely stripped. So I don't have a complete 100% answer for you there. But um, and it, of course, depends on how many caterpillars and so forth you have eaten it. Uh, on a May pop from Native Nursery two years ago, growing really well, but zero caterpillars. Keep trying. Keep trying. Maybe try um, the corky stem as well. Um, or maybe a couple other varieties of, uh, of uh, passion vine. I'm sorry, you don't have caterpillars yet. Me too. Do cone flowers thrive here? I see them for sale, but not anyone's garden that I know of. Um, I've grown them. I have not had success getting them to do that big, huge patch of cone flowers that you see in those beautiful cottage gardens. Um, they university says they're um, native here and they're grown here, um, but you're right. I I see them for sale, but I haven't seen one of those big beautiful patches either. Um, but they are the university does recommend them, and they do say that they're native here and Florida friendly. Okay, let's see. Can these be grown in pots? Was that, Doreen, was that a specific plant you're referring to or just in general? Just in general. Yeah, you can do butterfly gardening in pots, um, certainly, um, and not a problem. So, you know, it's movable or if you have a small space, you can certainly do butterfly gardening in, in pots. Um, let's see. 
uh, mail order natives. Uh, let's see. Um, has anyone had success propagating giant leaf milkweed from cuttings? Jane, funny you ask that because one of our other master gardeners has been trying that as well. And so I told her I would experiment because I hadn't done it before. And I have not had success with it. It says it can be done. Um, but from the people I've talked to trying to do it, nobody seems to be successful yet in the group I've talked to that's tried it. I'm going to keep trying um, because it said it can be done and it shouldn't be difficult, but I've tried it in water, I've tried it in soil, I've tried root hormone, and I have not had success with it. I haven't uh, either. I have giant milkweed too, and I haven't had success. I've tried to break off some branches and repot it, and it, it doesn't grow. Uh, yeah. I have one going. That's fine. Did you? I just stuck it in the soil and watered it. And I mean, it's only been a couple months, but it's got uh, leaves coming out and it's looking okay. Good. We have hope then, Brenda. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. I said we have hope then. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nick and had Monarch eat another Monarch cat when there was no more milkweed. Yes, your caterpillars can be cannibalistic, kind of gross, but yes. And especially if you have a lot of large caterpillars when there's eggs um, or very small caterpillars, they can eat those. Um, unfortunately, part of nature, you, I mean, if you want to separate them, you certainly can do that and make sure they're on, you know, there's enough milkweed to go around, but yes, yeah, they will they can become cannibalistic. I actually found if you take uh, butternut squash and make them into cubes and stick them on wooden skewers and put them in the pots, they'll, they'll eat the butternut squash as well. Yeah, I have um, heard that as well, especially the later instar, like the fourth and fifth instar. I yeah. actually moved them on to the squash. <laughs> um, Jade, okay. oh, it's pipe vine invasive. Yes, there are varieties that are invasive. Um, and there are native uh, pipe vines as well. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have the botanical names off the top of my head, but yes, there are invasive pipe vines and there are, um, there are native pipe vines and non-invasive pipe vines. Let's see. Atala butterflies in Charlotte County. Um, I don't think they come up. Their host plant is Kunti. Um, I, I have not seen any Atalas, and I've had um, not to say they're not here. I would have to look to see, but I don't think they come up uh, this far north. Um, caterpillars attracted to succulents at all. Um, like the flowering. I would say, you know, if they can get a nectar source from it, maybe. I've, I've seen that. I've seen them on the uh, flowers of aloe and kalanchoe. Hmm. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Good examples. Uh, where do butterflies get their drinking water? Um, that's a good question. That's something we didn't talk about. Um, a lot of people have puddlings, what are called puddling stations in their butterfly gardens, which um, they, what butterflies often do is puddle. So if you have maybe a flat plate in, or a very shallow dish, you can put rocks in it with a little bit of water. They won't go in the water or necessarily sit on the side of a bird feeder and get water, but they'll look for puddles and um, drink water that way. Um, Kathleen, good. She's another one that has giant milk that propagates easy. Okay, very good. Oh, yes, that's a good point. I'm glad Kathleen said that. The milk um, not just giant, but uh, they can be a serious eye irritant. So with most milkweeds, they're going to have like a set, if you break them apart or cut one, they have a sappy, like white, like milk to them. And they can be, uh, they can be an irritant. You don't want to get in your eyes and some people are even sensitive enough for it. So, um, and, you know, you want to just be careful when handling that. Hmm. 
Um, I think I got everybody's question. Somebody asked if zebras are yellow and black, and I think that's a good question because I could swear I had some yellow and black ones in my yard. The zebra long wings? Yeah. Yeah, yellow and black. Um, the yellow can look almost um, like a pale yellow to so where it looks white, but yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And there are the swallowtails yeah. too. Um, but the zebra long wings are the ones we talked about that are mostly black that have the stripes. Any other questions? Um, I hope you guys learned something new today. Um, and I'm going to send out, if you don't mind, I'm going to send out to your email a survey monkey. We try to do evaluations for our, all of our programs to see um, what we did well, what we can improve on, what you might like to see next time. Um, so I'm going to send that out. I would really super appreciate it if you don't mind. It's just, I think, a five-question survey. And then um, if anybody wants, I can email you the PDF of the presentation. Um, from today too, so you can sit in front of you to refer back to. Hope I think I do have a few more. Let's see. Thank you. Oh, some stuff butterflies flying around them now. Excellent, Doreen. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. Well, that concludes our webinar. I really appreciate y'all being here. That was really great. So much for coming. <laughs> And we'll see you next time. Keep, keep an eye out for more webinars to come soon. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Great lunch, Sarah. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. I was late, Sarah, but I made it at the last few oh, okay, minutes. Thanks, Ralph. Hey. Well, <laughs> everything looked good at the end, so. Uh, I think, I think uh, we did okay. My cat yeah. got in front of the screen one time, just his yeah. head in front of the, but other than that, he was chewing on my cord, but other than that, I didn't turn myself into a potato, and oh. I don't think we had too many glitches, so we did okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, the beginning of many more, so. Yes, very a good forgiving audience, too, yeah. for <laughs> my first time teaching this way. <laughs> All right, well, have a good okay. weekend in Easter. Thanks, you too.